Now let's talk about this phrase. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. Now in Greek, the term is logos. Have you heard that term before? Logos. Everybody say it together. Logos. In the beginning was the word or logos. Now we need to talk about what this word meant when John was pinning it down. It's got a very, very rich history. Now again, we know it's a Greek word, but we have to remember the concept is a very Hebraic concept. It's rooted in Jewish soil, let's say, okay? Now again, notice the very opening words as we've seen of our prologue make it clear that the key to really understanding this reference to the word is found in the Hebrew Bible, right? Back to Genesis. Remember when we hear in the beginning, we're supposed to think what? Genesis. We're supposed to think Genesis, okay? So in that beginning, what happened? God spoke His word, and what happens? Creation. Yes, the universe is brought into existence all through chapter number 1 of Genesis. Remember, we find the story. God said this, let it be, and it was. Now, what's important for us to remember is when we think about a word today, it's a little bit different than the way ancient Jews thought of when they thought of the Word of God. The Word of God to an ancient Jew was a lot more than just an expression of thought. When you thought the Word of God, you thought power and you thought action. Okay? How you know Paul picks up on that when he starts talking about the Word of God is alive? It's powerful. How you know this word can transform lives? It's more than just words on a page. Who knows that? Friends, we've got to all remember that it's more than just words on a page. God's word, his logos, has power to do what? Create, bring things into existence, to bring order out of chaos, as it were. And you know, it's a pretty bleak picture when you open up the book of Genesis. Because God's there and he's moving over the face of the waters and there's nothing. It's only chaos. But then God begins to shine as a light in the darkness. And then he begins to bring order out of chaos. And that's a good pattern because he does the same thing in my life and he does the same thing in your life. God is the only one who can take disorder and take chaos and bring order out of it. So for a Jew, when they thought the word of God, when they heard that term, they thought about power. They thought about action. Let me read for you Psalm chapter 33, verse 6. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. Again, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. Now again, when we take this Greek word, logos, and we put it back into Aramaic, okay, we come out with the word memra. Memra. Not memory, but memra. Okay? Now, what happened among ancient Jews is they had, when they would oftentimes write out the scripture, they would write it down in Aramaic, and they would also add commentary to it. We call it a targum. We won't bog. But again, if you look at these early Aramaic targums, which are Aramaic translations of the Bible that have commentary in there with them, they talk about this individual called the Mimra who was actually God's agent in creation. The one for bringing order. The one for bringing creation into existence. So when John starts talking about in the beginning was the word, they're thinking the Mimra. They're thinking the Logos that was responsible for bringing everything into existence. Now notice again what happens here. It says, and the word was God. It doesn't say the word was like God. It doesn't say the word was almost God. But the word who we're going to identify as Jesus. John makes that very clear. Who the word is. The word is Jesus. It says he was God. Okay, so John's making an absolute affirmation, we would say, about the eternal existence of the word. Jesus has always been. Amen? He has always been. Now again, there are some groups that will say that Jesus was the first work of creation, and then God used him to create the world. But that's not what we find in the pages of John's gospel. The word has always been was with God in the beginning, and the Word was God. So the Word didn't come into being, nor was there ever a time when the Word was not. 
And it's interesting, even if we look at the Greek word order, which we won't do, obviously, tonight, but John moves uh, some words around in the Greek sentence to emphasize that Jesus is divine. Okay, He makes it very, very clear when we look again at the Greek text of the Gospel of John. Now, it's likely that the reason John is doing this, why is he making such a big issue out of this Logos concept? Why is he making such a big deal about it right at the beginning? Because most likely, he's uh, contrasting this Logos, his idea of the Logos, the proper idea of the Logos, with ancient ideas about the wisdom of God. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you look at some Jewish tradition, some Jewish works, they talk about the fact uh, that wisdom is spoken of as God's breath or God's word, which came forth from God. So a lot of people, when they thought of wisdom, they associated that with the logos or the word of God. Okay, But they didn't equate the word with God. Does that make sense? All right. Even in Proverbs, if you want to write this verse down, Shell's going to read it for us, and I promise we're going to make a point through here. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, talks about wisdom, or as we said, sometimes wisdom was understood as the word of God. It talks about wisdom being the first act of creation uh, just prior to the creation of the heavens and the earth. So Shell, if you would, read Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, and take it all the way down through verse 31, and then I think it will make it real clear while we're taking so much time to talk about this. Okay. The Lord created me, wisdom, at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the foundations of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. Okay, does everybody see what we're talking about? You could get the picture there that it was wisdom that was created first, and then God used wisdom to bring creation into existence. What John's trying to say is this. Listen, the Logos was not created, but he existed before the creation of all things. Again, Jesus is not kind of a watered-down version of God. He's not like almost God. He is divine. Amen. Let's not forget in John chapter 1, over and over and over, just in the very first chapter, we've got people already declaring his divinity, don't we? We don't find anything like that in the synoptics. Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Look, you won't find it. It's not there. Jesus will, in fact, use some terminology, and he'll do things that were only associated with God, and that will cause people to start saying, man, maybe Jesus is more than just a man. Okay? But again, John is making it very clear that his audience realize who the Word is and who Jesus is. Folks, if we can remember that he is the Creator and if he can take nothing and make something out of it, I promise you that that will put our problems into perspective. Hello? What are you dealing with tonight? What are you dealing with? And then think of it in light of the God that you serve. Think of it in light of the one who lives within you. Think of it in light of the power of God that, again, is available to us through His Word, through our Savior, through Jesus. It really puts everything into perspective. Okay, He has always been. He'll always be. If He can create something out of nothing, hey, He can do anything. So see, it doesn't shock us when we come to John chapter 9 and we meet a man who's been born blind. He has no capacity for sight. If you look at the Greek text, it's very clear. The man's eyes do not have the capacity for sight. And what does Jesus do? He stoops down and he does what he did way back in Genesis. He spits on the ground, takes some mud, fashions it, puts them in his eye sockets, go wash in the pool of Shiloh or Siloam. And what happens? He goes down, he washes, and guess what? He can see. 
That's a brand new set of eyes. That's a creative miracle. So we're supposed to be able to believe God for anything, no matter what our needs are. We've got to remember that He really does have all power in heaven and in earth. Be encouraged tonight. Whatever your situation is, John's making it very clear. Remember who this Logos is. Remember who this Word is. So again, we've got all these divine declarations that we see all the way through the Gospel of John. So Shell, why don't you go ahead and take us into the next couple verses. We've got a little time left tonight. So go ahead and take us through uh, the next couple verses with verse 2. Okay, it says, He was in the beginning with God. So he's repeating. Uh, what he said in verse 1, it's, it, it, it's re-emphasizing that the Word and no one else was with God in the beginning, number one. Number two, that he was with God before anything, before all time. And he did not come into being at the beginning, so to speak. He was the Word who was with God and is God. So in no uncertain terms, we are to understand that Jesus is God. Verses 3 and 4, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Since the Logos is the agent of creation, uh, he is therefore the bringer of life, the giver of life. Uh, again, we're tying the beginning of John's gospel to the creation story. Just as we read about God breathing the very breath of life into Adam, we read here that Jesus is the one through which all things came into being. Here it says that without him, very literally it says, not one thing came into being. Not one thing came into being without Jesus. Through him there is life. And that life is the light of all people. On the first day of creation, what did God say? Let there be light. And there was light. This light did not come about through uh, man's will. Jesus spoke it into existence. And without Jesus, there is no light. There is no life. We see here in Acts 3.15, uh, Jesus is called the author of life. Peter will say to the religious leaders, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Uh, so we see here that John is careful to point out that not only do we have the physical light of creation, we also have the spiritual light, that light of revelation that Jesus brings, that life that brings light, not only to just a few, but to all those who are willing to receive this light. Yeah, and look at verse number five. Look at it in your text there. What happens? And the light, where does it shine? Have you know that's when we need light, when it's dark? Hello? Jesus is going to tell his disciples in the synoptics, you are the light of the world. Yes, he says, I am the light of the world. While I'm in this world, I'm the light of the world. But have you know he's not physically in this world anymore? Is there still some light in this world? Yeah. Say, I am the light. Yeah. You are, we are, as a body of Messiah, as a body of Christ, we are the light. Notice this great creation motif. And the light shines in the darkness. It doesn't say, and the light shone. It's not past tense. So he's moved beyond Genesis chapter 1. That light that shone in the darkness way back at creation, that light is still shining. His light is still shining. So again, notice what happens. Just like it was in Genesis 1-2 where darkness was over the face of the deep and as Michelle said, God said, let there be Light. And guess what? There was light. And so see, the light of the Logos shone at the darkness way back at creation. But guess what? It continues to shine. He continues to shine amidst the darkness of a fallen humanity. Have you know, all we have to do is get to Genesis chapter 3 and things aren't looking so great anymore, are they? It didn't take long. We don't know how long. 
The best we can tell, it didn't take very long for darkness to come back into this world through sin. But that light is still shining. That gospel light that's shown all the way back in Genesis continues to shine. And notice what it says, and the darkness has not overcome the light or overcome it. Maybe your translation reads, has not understood it. You can translate that Greek word either way. But the important thing here is, again, the light, it shines in the darkness. Present tense. And the darkness has not, and we could even say, will never, what? Overcome it. How you know the darkness is not going to overcome the light? It's not going to happen. I know sometimes when we look at this world, we can get very discouraged. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hello? You know what I'm talking about? We can look around and we go, what is going on in this world? The light shines in the darkness. Every day as I live my life, every day as you live your life, the light shines in the darkness. And it will not overcome it. And unfortunately, there will be many in that darkness that will not understand it. See how the two things are linked together? There's two great truths here, and we can translate either way, and both work. We don't ever have to wonder about the darkness of humanity and the darkness of sin overcoming or conquering or mastering the light. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. But unfortunately, we know that not all, even when that light shines in the darkness, not all are going to understand all we have to do is read verse number 11. Michelle read it for us. You read along with us, right? Not all are going to receive that light, are they? But to those who do, there's hope, John says. Notice in verses 12 through 13. Yes, I'm getting ahead of myself. I do it all the time. Can't help it. But in verses 12 and 13, what happens? But to those who believe. Where's the emphasis? Not on those that don't believe. Friend, don't get your eyes on those that don't believe. Don't do that. God doesn't do that. Our pattern, what keeps us going is to remember that there will be, as, as we shine that light, not everybody may understand, not everybody may accept, but there will be some that will. Let's put our attention on that. That's who God puts His attention on. Those that will believe. So again, it's a great truth. Would you agree? Here we have it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, and unfortunately the darkness has not always understood it. Now I want to give you another great quote. It's crucial to remember that the evangelist, we're talking about John here, was writing with a post-resurrection perspective. See, he had, as our pastor said, read the last chapter and he knew who won. Have you know it didn't end in the crucifixion? The crucifixion, we know what happens at the crucifixion. What happens? Darkness falls. When Judas and John goes out to betray Jesus, John says, and it was night. Here we have that light and darkness imagery that runs all through the gospel of John. It could look dark. It could look like defeat. God's not in control, you could think. What's happening? Why is Jesus letting this happen? But all we have to do is wait till that third day. Wait till the third day and light shines out of that tomb. And here comes Jesus. The de death couldn't hold him. Darkness had no power over him. So when John writes this, he knows what all's gone on. Maybe his readers didn't. And he's preparing them for the events that are going to unfold. He's preparing them for what they're going to read when they find out that the Logos appeared to be overcome by the darkness. But no, don't think that for a minute. God's got a plan. So he's got a post-resurrection view, we would say. He says, uh, the quote goes on, From his point of view, there was no guesswork in how the story would turn out. How you know there's no guesswork? We know how this thing's going to end, don't we? We do. The light of the logo shone and continues to shine. Certainly the darkness did not accept it, but neither did it have the victory over it. That is a great quote. Would you agree? Yeah, our focus should always be on those that are going to accept, not on the ones that aren't going to accept. Now, again... What we're going to do, I want to read for you. Michelle, would you read for us uh, verses 6 through 8? We're going to close with that, if you would. Notice what happens right after this. We find an individual by the name of John the Baptist that's mentioned. Let's read this. Read us through uh, verse number 8, if you would, Michelle, from 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name 
was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. Yeah. So here we find we're going to meet John now. Remember all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in their opening chapter, some of them in their very opening verses, talk about this guy that we know as John the Baptist. What was his role again, according to John? Was he the light? What was his, what was his task? Pave the way. To pave the way? Yeah, but specifically here. To be a witness. To testify. Does everybody know what a witness is? If you show up in court and you're going to say you're a witness, you better have been there. You better have seen it. You better have experienced it or there's going to be a problem. That's what a witness is. So again, you see the point here. John the Baptist really becomes a great example for all of us, doesn't he? I'm not the light. You're not the light. But we better be bearing witness to the light. We better be testifying. And remember, we've got to do that based on a what? A personal experience. So John comes and what's he doing? He's making it clear. I am not the light. Don't get your, nope, don't get your eyes on me. I'm just here pointing you to the light. Again, what was the verse right before this? The light is shining in the darkness. How is the light going to shine in the darkness? Through us. Look around the room. Here's how, here's how light's going to shine in this community amidst the darkness. And we've got to do what John did. We've got to stand up and we've got to be willing to what? To testify. We've got to be willing to point people, like you said, brother, to prepare the way for the Messiah. To prepare the way for the truth and the life. Alrighty, well let's pick up if we could at John chapter 1 verse 9. We'll read all the way through verse 18. So Shell, kick us off, babe. Okay, the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home and his own received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. And from his fullness we all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. So it starts off, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. There in verse 9, John the Beloved speaks here of Jesus as the true light, the real, the genuine, the ultimate light. A number of times in the Gospel of John, we see this designation, this word, something being true. Here, Jesus is the true light. Jesus will tell the woman at the well in John chapter 4 uh, that true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. In chapter 6, Jesus declares himself to be the true bread from heaven. He calls himself the true vine in John chapter 15. He'll say, he who sent me is true in chapter 7 and in chapter 17 it says now this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent so here that theme of something being true is emphasized and Jesus is described as the true light the real light the genuine light the ultimate light, we might say. Jesus is the true light. The same Jesus who created all things, even bringing light into the world with his spoken word, is now described as the ultimate light himself. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. He is the ultimate light. It says that he is the light that will illuminate or enlighten all 
mankind, all humanity. And this passage even looks ahead uh, to the mission uh, when God's light is going to be poured out into the whole world. Israel's role was to be a light to the nations. We read about that in Isaiah chapter 42. The prophet Isaiah foretells uh, that eventually all the nations will come into the light there in Isaiah 60 where it says arise shine for your light has come and verse 9 here in John chapter 1 is giving us a hint of what is to come in the ministry of Jesus we see in the ministry of Jesus that he even allowed the Gentiles those pagans who were formerly pagans idol worshipers who would put their faith in a Jewish Messiah he even allowed them to come into the light. For example, when he healed the Syrophoenician, uh, her, the woman her, whose daughter was so sick that came and, and she was begging Jesus to heal her daughter, we saw that Jesus welcomed her in and healed that precious daughter. Uh, and Jesus will give his disciples that great commission to go into all the world, not just Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but all the world and make disciples. So Jesus has proclaimed a gospel for everyone, for all humanity. And one day as Jesus is in the temple there in Jerusalem, he declares himself to be the light of the world. We read about this in the gospel of John several times, John chapter 8, John chapter 12, John chapter 8. He says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of of life. Have the light of life. Uh, Jesus also tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. He says, I'm the light of the world. He tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. So that light that he gives us as disciples, we are to take that light and illuminate the darkness just as Jesus did. And so we see the light of Jesus illuminates everyone and is for everyone. This light is going to shine whether we see it or not doesn't it? It shines in the darkest places.